Thank you. Well, thank you to the organizers for, uh, for the invitation. And uh, it's an exciting meeting and something that definitely uh, needs to go forward because of the, of the practicalities. And you know, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be in a situation where we need to solve this problem as, a point, as opposed to uh, maybe what we should have done a few years ago, and that was uh, try to solve the problem. Um, but you know, sometimes we need that, we need that pressure to, to really go forward. Um, in, the, in the area of pharmacogenetics, the, the, the same issue was there. And there's a, a number of us who were in a situation where uh, we were going forward at our own institution with, with uh, genetic tests to predict drug effect. But there weren't national guidelines or international guidelines or even discipline-based guidelines uh, to, to go forward. And so uh, uh, three people in particular, Mary Relling at St. Jude's, Dan Roden at Vanderbilt, and myself, uh, bemoaned that fact. And then we each set up our own separate way of doing it. We had one called Smart Drug that we thought was uh, well-named, at least. Um, and then uh, the, the others uh, had their own versions. And then the Pharmacogenetic Research Network, and Rochelle Long is here, um, were, was able to really coalesce into a, a, a much more uh, formal and, and uh, a concise a, a way of, of trying to really tackle this issue, something called the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium. And, and so it, it really, the, the, the issue that each of us in the room look at pharmacogenetics is, is quite different. Uh, there's a lot of the early discussion was really in the, um, how do we take uh, genetic variants as they've been discovered can, I don't know where the pointer is along uh, here somewhere, but how do we take genetic variants as they're discovered? Did you use that one, or is, is there a lightsaber version? All right. All right. The one that says eject? No, okay. Um, so, you know, a lot of the discussion this morning was, you know, how do we take new variants that have been discovered and try to make sense of them? That certainly is important. Um, there's work in terms of trying to find those rare individuals that have some kind of either genetic predisposition or some sort of phenotype and do something about them. There's a lot of other phenotype-based work. But really on the, on the clinical practice side, there has been very little in terms of guidelines and recommendations in the pharmacogenetics area. We're at, at least one from, from EGAP. But in terms of the volume of work, there's, there's been very little. And so we, we put together some effort to try to, to, try to tackle this. Um, part of the problem has been the way that we in academia have, have tried to solve this issue, um, and that is that we've been great at discovering things, we've been okay at validating, and we've been completely crap at anything after that. And I know AHRQ has tried to help us be better, um, but we, we have resisted their help. And you'll tell us what we should be doing next in the next talk, but um, really the idea of, of um, stopping at New England Journal and rather going forward um, is, is something that you know, we, we have to take some responsibility for um, and, and has left us in a position like we are now trying to, to figure out a, a pathway. And so in the, in the uh, ways that these have been evaluated, um, a number of different questions have been asked. And a lot of times the question is, is, uh, you know, is pharmacogenetics useful? Or when should a test be ordered? Or what does enough data look like? And then there's my personal favorite, is anything ever ready for prime time? <laughs> and you know, those of us that write grants to the, at least in the, in the US side, and I know there's a UK equivalent of this, but if you ever don't like a grant but you don't know why, just say it's overambitious. <laughs> um, and, and it's the same, it's, this is the overambitious equivalent. It's, you know, um, well, it's not ready for prime time, which means I don't know how to do it. And therefore, it's not ready for prime time. Um, and so we, we've really approached it in, in that sort of way. And so we try to change it around. Take, you know, those of you that speak French, please pardon me, but the Voltaire uh, English translation version of a uh, perfect being the enemy of good. You know, can we do something with these tests? And so, yes, I stuck the word in there for you, David. You're welcome. Um, uh, if a patient arrives with pharmacogenetic, is it actionable? And yes, we have t-shirts and, and uh, screensavers, et cetera, for you. Um, but the idea that not should we order the test or, oh, that's, but if they come in, can we act on it? Or, sh or should we act on it, has been the, the basis for, for the, uh, the approach. Now, the Pharmacogenetic Research Network and the Pharmacogenetics Knowledge Base, which is the, the uh, online affiliate of that, um, have uh, um, detail a number of different consortium, um, one of them being this uh, consortium that I'm briefly talking to you about uh, today. Uh, this consortium has uh, individuals from 
uh, 60 different sites, uh, 33 different institutions, sorry, 60 different members from 33 institutions, um, including some international representation. Uh, those of you from the UK, it's Manchester and Liverpool. I know the dots are so big, it covers the entire UK, um, but uh, there, there you are. Um, it would be uh, great to have more representation from there, but that's a, it's a start. Also, there's a uh, funny color there in Leiden. Um, it's supposed to be Leiden, um, because the, the Dutch group um, brings a, a whole network of, of Dutch investigators in there. Um, then we have Spain and Italy, also a Taiwanese group and a Brazilian group, uh, just to uh, bring some extra flair. Um, observers from the NIH institutes, from the FDA, um, are, are participants in this list. And it's really the approach, for those of you that are under 30, this is crowdsourcing. So we have to have some translation, because for those of us who are over 30. Uh, but uh, it, we just basically took a bunch of people and said, all right, let's build some consensus around these in an expedited fashion. Now, we've, we've um, really prioritized based on community input. I'll come back to this in, a, in, in the next slide, um, in terms of how we've, we've developed this, uh, the, the list. We, we've, no, I'll move that. The, the other part is we've really looked at recommendations around the, the action that can be taken. And so I, I put this on here that um, if, you know, if you've ever had a paper that said more research is needed at the end of it, <laughs> what that means is we didn't do the right experiment. <laughs> and, and it's the same thing. You know, there's so many guidelines where um, more data is needed. Well, duh. I mean, of course, more data. More data is always needed. But the, the, when the patient comes in, they're not saying, um, should I come in now or is more data needed? <laughs> you know, they're, they're coming in for some help now. And so you give them the best help you can give them now, realizing if they'd come in a month later, you might have been smarter. Um, and, and that's just reality. And so we've tried to take that approach where, yes, more data is needed, but what can we say today? Now, let's see. The other thing is I want to, as a disclosure down here, this is a group of people who think pharmacogenetics matters. Many of the people on this group, it doesn't matter what the question is, the answer is pharmacogenetics. <laughs> so as you, you realize that you know, we're, we're looking at it saying, we believe, but how should we apply it? So it's trying to figure out which version of religion, not should we, uh, not is there a God? Um, and, and so uh, there, there is a bias there in terms of how do we implement this stuff, um, not should we, uh, or even consider it. There's an assumption that the data that we're talking about will go into the electronic medical record. And you'll see that as we get into some of the, of the ways we evaluate this data, that that is an important uh, part of this. We think that it'll be CLIA in the US, uh, uh, whatever the European uh, or the UK version of that is, uh, for, in terms of the quality of analyses. We have also started with, with what I consider baby steps. So we've gone and taken um, lists from professional organizations, uh, lists from uh, FDA labeling, uh, taken sources from uh, Center of Medicare, Medicaid Services, or other third party payers, uh, any place where there's lawsuits that have penalized uh, clinicians, we haven't left that out. Uh, so that's mainly been the Stevens-Johnson syndrome type of, of, of areas, um, where there's available standalone clinical tests, uh, where there's clinical trials just, um, uh, suggesting the, the sort of uh, functional variation, uh, functional impact, narrow therapeutic index, and then I'm going to jump to the very last one. Examples where there's clear evidence for, for one drug, and there's other drugs that use the exact same pathway and have similar in vitro or, or in vivo um, data suggesting that if it's true for A, it will also be true for B. And I couldn't think of a better way of saying that, but hopefully you get what I mean um, in terms of trying to look at if we make a clear statement one way, what other data, what other examples should also then be, be, uh, be true. So this is a, an example of a survey that we, that we did. Uh, Mary Relling, uh, leading this effort, uh, looked at uh, a number of members of the American Society of Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics. They came up with a list of different drug gene examples. Uh, the, the, most, uh, the, the, the one that was quoted the most often was CYP2C9 and warfarin, and the list goes down. Um, three of the top 11 uh, were for thiopurine methyltransferase. Um, and, and because uh, Mary Relling uh, was one of the uh, pioneers in that area, and she was the head of, of CPIC, um, that's where we started. So uh, this was a good excuse to do it, uh, but it was a, a key, key one. And so we've, we've taken those kind of survey type data as a, a place to start. We have a large number of examples that are either already published, and I'll show you a little bit of those, or are either in press or have been initiated. 
again, coming from either surveys or requests that have been made uh, from a variety of different people, from regulators, from third-party payers, uh, from, from clinicians, uh, from members of the CPIC um, Alliance. We developed the guidelines in a, and don't worry, I'm not gonna go through each of these, but we have a, a structured format in terms of the evaluation. We've tried to take best practices from, from EGAP, from a number of the other guideline building um, organizations, and, and put them into place uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the practical endpoints being around interpretation and actionability. Uh, it, it's uh, information on the, the gene, information on the drug, I information that, that includes uh, available test options, including non-genetic test options. So for example, there are, are some tests where there's a genetic test, there's a red blood cell phenotype test, there's a blood level test, there's even a breath test in, in some cases that, that give you the, the exact same type of data. And so we try to put all of that in the same document so one doesn't just think that the world is a double helix. So this is an example of one for thiopurin methyltransferase that came out uh, uh, earlier this year. Uh, it was one of the first examples that, that came out. And uh, from that, um, really looking at what genotypes have severe functional effect that would change clinical action, and then what drugs are so clearly affected that clinicians would be wrong not to act on the data. So really looking at whatever David wants to call actionability um, in terms of, of, our, of our approach. And we get these tables, and this would be the kind of table that we would put on a t-shirt and give to every clinician. No, not really. Um, this is sort of data that if you wanted to dig into it, um, would tell you uh, more information. Um, if we blow it up a little bit, we're actually giving drug uh, dosing recommendations and our version of the, the level of strength of the data. So the, it's not one should consider testing for, it's you should test and here's what you should do based on that. Um, realizing it's an iterative process, but the biggest complaint from, for example, the FDA label change has been they recommended that the test be used, they identified risk, but didn't make any recommendations on what to do with it. And so we went that final step. Now, there are some examples where the answer is this test should not be used, or that there is risk, but we don't know what to do other than not give the drug. And, and so it's not, exact, it's not as if this select group has all the answers we haven't been telling you. Um, it's, it's as we look through the data, can we act, should we act, what should we do, has been uh, how we've been dri driven. In some cases, it's, it's a, an algorithm-based output um, that, comes, that, that comes forward. Um, but in, I'm gonna skip through in the interest of time. Um, as they, they've come out, uh, we've been um, iterating in terms of the way we've done these, in terms of the quality, and also getting a lot more participants. So the, initially, it was an insider's club in terms of people who were uh, early adopters to the consortium. Now there's people who have read these and say, hey, I'm really interested in this topic. I wanna be involved with it. And in, in some cases, I wanna make sure you guys don't recommend something crazy um, is, has been the, the motivation uh, to, to be part of this. Um, PharmGKB itself, has not only the papers and the recommendations, um, but has also brought in other uh, types of guidelines. So for example, if you were to go to the site, um, I, I did this screen capture to uh, show that it, it has, for example, the CPIC recommendations, but also what's shown in orange here are from the Dutch uh, Pharmacogenetics Working Group. And, and so any uh, national or international recommendations that come out will be pulled into this site. And so even within CPIC, we don't think we're the answer to all questions, uh, but rather trying to uh, pull things forward. And in, in the case of the the Dutch group, they are now part of CPIC, and so their, their input is part of the recommendations that are, that are coming forward. Now, this is the last slide, um, and first of all, we we'll say there's a lot to do, and so anybody that, that wants to be actively involved with this or knows someone who does, um, please go to the PharmGKB website. You can see the rules. There's a memorandum of understanding. There's publication uh, recommendations, except, or not recommendations, but rules. Um, you can go on there, and you can sign up and, and be, be part of this. Uh, secondly, we, we really want to do this right. We're not doing this for, for academic career development. Uh, we're doing this to try to help the field go forward. And so any comments that people have, e either now or, or via the website, um, would be very well received, even if they're hurtful and malicious, um, because uh, they, they, uh, we, we do want this to be a better process um, a as we go forward. Um, and then lastly, in, in the clinic, a, a no guideline isn't helpful. Uh, we, we need to, to be trying to look at, and a lot of the dri what's been driven here is, is not should we do it or not, but if the data's there, whether it's from 23andMe, from a whole genome scan, from some quack that they saw before us, um, if the data's already there, 
what should we do with it? Um, and so rather than saying no, we need to say why it's no, or how and when it's no, um, in, in terms of those. Um, and so I'll stop at that point uh, and uh, do whatever we do next. Thank you, Howard. Questions or comments? Ned? I'm glad you clarified, because actually a no guideline is very helpful if you know why you're saying no. Right. The yes. guideline that is totally unhelpful, and I, I will own this, is I don't know. So right. That's, and that's, I think, where a lot of where we're at. So you're right. We need to do a better job when we don't know. Mark? So I'll pick on the TPMT just because it's, uh, it's one of my favorites. And, and uh, in, in the recommendations, it, it uh, sort of separates out, um, or it doesn't address, to my knowledge, the clinical context. In other words, are you using uh, azathioprine for treatment uh, of um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease as opposed to acute yeah. lymphoblastic leukemia? Right. Uh, the, you know, the risks related to the efficacy effects, which you know, some people are dismissive of, I happen not to be, yeah. um, are different in those scenarios. And right. so uh, can you tell me a little bit about um, how you're trying to balance the uh, uh, the efficacy versus adverse events, because I'm cognizant of the fact that we're three times more willing to kill somebody by not doing something than we are by doing something. I mean, that's been well documented, that we're, we're much more sensitive to adverse events than by killing somebody from not giving a proper dose. So you, you've identified a, an important element. Uh, in some cases, the, the test and the drug are associated with one area, and that's it. But in thiopurine methyltransferase, the, the uses are dramatically different. Um, not so much dramatically different in terms of the, the effect of the drug, but in the terms of the type of monitoring uh, that a patient receives. With, uh, in this case, we d developed this initial one, and it's mainly focused around childhood leukemia, partly because we wanted to get a first one through the process and out and then we can iterate on that, partly because we didn't have at the time a lot of rheumatology, gastroenterology, dermatology folks involved, and that has changed, um, and, and, and partly because of the, of the focus of, of those who were involved. Uh, it's very true that most of the time, TPMT testing is not done in childhood leukemia, even though that's where the package insert recommendation is, mainly because uh, most hematologists are very comfortable with neutropenia, and the idea that, that um, one, in fact, neutropenia is a, an endpoint in, in some cases. They, they, they treat to, in two neutropenia. In rheumatic disease, in gastroenterology, and certainly in dermatology, um, often they don't see patients more frequently than once every month or every three months. In, in a case where, where um, someone might have toxicity on day 10, you don't want to wait a month. Um, and so there have been, um, that's where the big uptake has been in the, in the U.S., and at least based on the literature surveys also in the U.K., although I think that's changing. Um, but um, that's, that's why we did it that way. We're, we're trying to get better at that. And now that this is out there, there's some publications, it's easier to go and get people involved. Uh, so we had an HIV example that's coming through the pipeline. It was very easy to go get HIV uh, physicians and, and clinicians from different parts of the, of the world involved with this because they could see what's been done in the past. They didn't have to imagine it. Um, and they, they knew it was an issue, and then they, they got in. Tim? Is anybody doing health economics analysis over each of these variants to work out you know, prevalence in the population, what the sort of DALI effects? So we have not included it yet in, in this. For some of the same reasons, lack of expertise is an important part of that. The, the, health, the health economists, so in, for the TPMT example, um, there have been a, a few health economic analyses that have been done, both in the UK and, and the US. The, uh, the good news is whatever you want the answer to be, there's a paper for you. Um, and, and so I, I think what that's focusing on is that the, the right study hasn't been done or, 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 or such. Um, and, and, but I, I do agree that this is a really important part of it. I mean, even in the US, we're waking up to the fact that drugs cost money. Um, and uh, we, we need to be aware of that. Well, I would have thought, thought even within the HMOs, they might be doing they may have, they're not in the public domain that I'm aware of. Yeah, there, there's very little of it actually that's being done, again, for uh, reasons that within integrated systems, uh, there are very few people that are actually have the expertise to do it. We've, we've done it uh, uh, in, in a couple of examples, Lynch syndrome, uh, which we published in the American Journal of Managed Care in August of this year. The problem in the U.S. is what perspective do you take? Um, because we don't have a national health care perspective as much as we'd like to pretend that we do. And so the issue that really comes down to is, is that 
Um, there may be a, something that's cost effective from a societal perspective, but as a hospital, it's going to cost me a ton of money, and it may in fact negatively affect my margin to the point that I can't be viable, and there's no way for me to recoup. So we're in a very challenged position to be able to do this from a U.S. perspective since we really don't have one since we're disintegrated. Again, I would have thought the HMOs, you know, the prevention, from their point of view, prevention is good there too because it's well, the money. Well, but, but it is and it isn't because how long are you going to keep that member? So if your member turns over in two years and you prevented something that's five years, so it's, it, it's, not a, it's not a simple question. And that's one of the reasons why I think nationally there's talk about accountable care organizations, that the idea is, is that, wait a second, we're all providing health care. We all have a stake in the health of the nation. Therefore, we all have to chip in to the pot. Now, how that's actually going to play out in terms of uh, implementation is not clear. There's another dimension to that that should get inserted here, and that is that any one person really doesn't give a crap about the effect on the national economy or <laughs> even the economy of one health organization. If, I'm, if I've got a condition or I'm being suggested to take or not take a drug, all I really care about is, is it going to work for me and is it going to make me feel better or worse? And the yeah. individual has a very different priority from any of the other issues that just got mentioned. Yep, yeah. that's right. Okay, thank you, Howard. Okay.